What's up guys and welcome back to Moan Inc. If you guys are new here, well then, hello. My name is Erica and it is a pleasure to have you joining us today on the channel because for today's video, as you can see from the title, I am chatting to none other than Dr. Emma Southern about her new release, The History of the Roman Empire in 21 Women. Now, I absolutely adored this book, but this is not the only book that Emma Southern has published. She has a number of other books that you guys can find in the description below, including one about Agrippina the Younger and one about murder in ancient Rome titled A Fatal Thing It Happened on the Way to the Forum. So definitely go and check those out if you guys want any other books by Emma, if as we're talking, we convince you. But obviously we are here to discuss the ladies that have helped shape the Roman Empire according to the ancient sources. Now, before we can dive into all of that, Emma, I do start all of these interviews off by asking my guests about their classics and their ancient history background. So for someone as accomplished as you with their PhD, multiple books under their belt, you know, quite the career, might I add, how did you start this journey? Before we get to that point, how did you get into ancient history? When did you discover it? And how did it lead you to getting to the point that you're at today? Um, as with virtually everything in my life, it kind of came about by accident, um, which is that I only started doing ancient history for two reasons. One, that I wanted an excuse to not do my A-levels at the school I had done my GCSEs at, and they didn't offer ancient history. Um, so I did ancient history instead of straight history. Um, and two, the ancient history A-level that I was offered um, at the sixth form college I wanted to go to did uh, trips to Greece and to Italy. And I wanted to go on those. And I was like, if nothing else, like I quite liked history at GCSE. It wasn't like my favorite thing in the world. I wanted to do sociology, psychology kind of things originally. Um, but I thought, you know, history, I didn't hate it. I did, I did well in my GCSE. I really don't want to do modern history again and I don't want to stay at my school so it's a good excuse I'm going to go and do a, an A-level that they don't offer and that'll be my reason for why I can't stay there and then I just completely fell in love with it <laughs> there was no um forethought to it at all and I had an amazing teacher who was called Jill Partington um and she was brilliant and she just completely made everything wonderful and she introduced us the first thing we did was aristophanes the frogs which she made us read aloud and do the bracket quacks 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 bracket quacks quacks which i will remember forever and then we did and then she told us about uh, the bob guccione film caligula um which obviously i then watched and was like this is the greatest thing that has ever happened i can't believe that this has been hidden from me <laughs> for 16 years of my life and went to Italy we went to Greece on trips and they were brilliant and um, then I originally was not going to do ancient history at university that was not my plan I actually went to university to do uh, psychology at Royal Holloway um, and I got there and I was studying it and I did six weeks and about I would say three days in was like I have made a terrible mistake <laughs> I I actually love history um like I do not want to be doing psychology I don't want to be doing stats I don't want to be a psychologist which is I thought I thought I wanted to do um and so I quit after six weeks um and then moved in with my boyfriend at the time in Birmingham to avoid going home because uh, like literally all of my life is just accidents <laughs> so he he was at university of Birmingham so I moved in with him to I apologize to all of his housemates that I moved in with because I just turned up um, and then decided that I would just go to university in Birmingham to be near him. We broke up in the middle of my first year, but I loved Birmingham, loved the people there, loved the ancient history course, which wasn't a classics course. It was very history based. Um, and it was one of the only places where I could do history without archaeology. I could do languages without doing classics. So I didn't have to just be studying poetry or dirt. Um, I could just do history, which is what I really loved. And then, yeah, and then I tried to leave again at the end of my undergraduate. I was going to go and be a librarian. Um, I'm always trying to be pragmatic and then didn't even make it to that course. Like I made it to the day that I got my results. I was like, no, I'm coming back to do a master's degree. <laughs> I went back and then have been in history ever since. So uh, it was a pure accident. And I kept trying to deny my love for it. Like, um, but 
in the end, the Romans, they've got me, they've got my heart. And it, there is never a time when I'm happier than when I'm just sitting down with some sources and some theory and trying to work out what the hell was going on in their little brains. That is fascinating. But this was literally <laughs> all such an accident and you kept it coming is. back to it. So what was it about it that kept pulling you back in? Was that, was it just, it was really fun? Was it kind of like a little escape? I think the, uh, this kind of outrageousness of Raymond's, I think is what I love and their like it, internal inconsistency, like their image of their se- themselves, the way that they portray themselves and then the way that they are portrayed by everybody else or even like the way that they imagine themselves and then how they present themselves are just so contradictory because they're like yes as the most moral upstanding people that have ever existed and here are this series of books that we have written about how we are the best most moral people and that's why we've got this empire as a reward because of all our moral activities um, and our moral activities are the murderings <laughs> That's how moral we are, the murders. Just like, so that disconnect is so funny um, and so consistently fascinating. And just as a, what we've got left of them is so fascinating. Like we have so much material culture from so many different, kind of parts of the empire and different aspects of the life of the empire that you don't really have for most other cultures like we have just enough that it's tantalizing um and fascinating and we have so many different aspects but there's still these massive gaps that you have to fill in with imagination um it's kind of like this is why I think people like Star Wars so much which is that there's simultaneously loads of it but also third of it doesn't make any sense at all like what the (laughs) hell is the force no one knows like how does this work in anywhere else in this ginormous galactic empire who knows and it's kind of like that like you have all of these details about roman life and about roman you have what seems like so much information but you also have like these ginormous gaps where you're just like yeah we have no idea what happened in that five-year period (laughs) (laughs) we just genuinely no clue who was in charge during that point and that kind of balance of detail and obscurity and uh, and confused self-presentation and wild excess combined with refusing to enjoy anything at all um, just makes me love them so much. So you have chosen your side as Romans because oh, yeah. within classics and history in general, people are either Greek people or they're Roman people. Like that's what you like to study. Was that... During when you were studying ancient history, were you also studying the ancient Greeks? And just very quickly, yeah. you were like, no, thank you, not for me. Yeah, I think pretty quickly I was like, Romans are my babies. Um, because because I remember we did Aristophanes and then you do like Thucydides and Herodotus and the tragedians. And I think that the Greeks, apart from Aristophanes, oh, it, they largely came across it too seriously to me. <laughs> and not funny enough and therefore not, not worth enough. the time. <laughs> Although um, hilariously, the Romans are a fundamentally unfunny culture. Like, <laughs> like the Greeks are funny. Um, like they have genuinely good jokes, and the Romans are so unfunny that it makes them funny. <laughs> you know what? Though you say that, and when I lived in New York when I did my degree, I was babysitting this girl who was like nine or ten at the time that I was babysitting her. And my job was just to pick her up from school and bring her home or whatever. And there was one time when I picked her up from school and we were chatting about something about her day. And I said something and she looked at me dead in the eye, Emma. And she goes, you know, Erica, you're funny because you're not funny. (laughs) My God, you're the Romans of babysitters. (laughs) Literally, as soon as you said that, I'm like, wow, Wow. is that me? Like, (laughs) There's nothing worse than being bodied by a (laughs) nine-year-old. But you know what? I had so much respect for her. I was like, the fact that you said that to me, knowing that I'm in charge of this situation, I can't hate you. I just can't. No, I mean, no, I appreciate the honesty. (laughs) I just feel like she meant it as a compliment as well. (laughs) Anyway, so with your book, let's talk about Mm -hmm. some little intricacies of your book. The way you start, I know that everybody has asked you about this, (laughs) is about the anecdote that you say from the 1970s where these students these female students go to their professor and they ask you know can we have a course on roman women and the professor's like no might as well have given you a course on roman dogs now the thing that i was curious about is because you explained this story hundreds of times and you said this is why it's so important and you know this is why we've had this little boom in this niche of those women who then end up writing about it so on and so forth but from your perspective do you think 
that people prior to that moment were they educated about women and they just thought that those stories were not interesting or do you think that this was like a course full of people that were just never opened to how interesting (laughs) women were and so they came up with this narrative in their head that they're not worth teaching about I think that they it's from this that kind of earlier tradition of what history is and for a lot of those older professors who were already you know this is a story from Amy Richlin it's Jen she tells it um in one of her books um that that she is the person who asked for this this course and the professor said no uh, basically like you are here to learn about um politics and war basically (laughs) and that is what history is and if you go and learn ancient history or this is american um university so they're probably doing a certain amount of politics and a whole lot of poetry and learning philology um and that kind of very much involved in learning the language and learning the poetry and then learning about politicians essentially um, and really analyzing Cicero's usage of the Gerund or whatever um, and that is what history was that's what studying classics in particular was it that was what was important because classics was the foundation of western civilization and all the rest of it um, and the idea that you might want to study the people within that or the idea that you might want to study um, what it was like to exist in the world of latin <laughs> um, and the world of cicero's use of the gerund um, my was just like fundamentally incompatible with what they thought the study of classics and the study of history was um and so to them you may as well study dogs because you what's the point of studying experience um that's sociology um and but it is what and it's part of that um it's called the linguistic turn but like in the 1960s where you get this big turn in the in the study of literature where you're suddenly studying what people what do people mean when they're talking about this what does how do people read it um and then that filtered into classics and then people start saying okay but who is reading this and who is um living in this world of Livy and uh, if Livy and Ovid and Catullus are all hanging out then okay (laughs) Um, what's happening at those dinner parties and start really thinking about kind of wider questions of the world and then start in the kind of post-war world thinking maybe these guys are not the pinnacle of everything that man should be (laughs) um and it, it is the beginnings of a really big fundamental shift in in what we're looking at when we look at the past and why we're looking at the past and what it means to us in the present like um for a lot of people, particularly when it was kept to something that only men could do and only men of a particular class could do because nothing was ever translated out of Latin or Greek. Um, and um, I don't know if you've ever seen the original Loeb versions of Suetonius, but it has two paragraphs of the life of Tiberius, which are not translated. Um, so the two paragraphs about what he gets up to on Capri uh, in the original 1920s translations were not translated into English in order to prevent people who were not educated enough to cope with it. <laughs> no way. Yeah. So in order to protect women and the uneducated from knowing about what Tiberius was doing on Capri. <laughs> Scandal. What? <laughs> Right. And they weren't translated until a much later edition. Um, but if you get one of the original ones, there's just two chunks in the middle that are um that are not translated, which is really funny. Uh, but that idea, like that is it was accessible only to a certain class, um, and it was kept to only a certain class, and certain bits of knowledge obviously were made sure that nobody else could access them. Um, but once you started getting people studying it who were not of those class, like working class Jewish women like Amy Richlin and um, she says that basically the women and the people who were invisible to the men of the class who were ruling classics up until that point um, were not invisible to them and she says we're not invisible to each other like when she looks she was reading Ovid um, in the original translation and she wasn't thinking oh I am Ovid writing about this she was thinking 
I am one of the Sabine women who is being raped in this story. How is that? How am I as a woman reading this? And her professors were just not interested basically in talking about those subjects. And so she had to push the the boundaries of what the uh, of what classics was and then what ancient history was in order to include those conversations. Um, and so I do think it's a really important turn in you know that leads to me and you being here as two women talking about it and talking about real women in the past as something that we should be thinking about um or that is interesting at all to think about in the ancient world absolutely and also i heard that when you were coming up with the idea for this book that it's because you work in a bookshop and you were seeing all of these greek myth retellings and you were like no <laughs> the romans oh, yeah, need no. their time at least like two percent I say two percent it's definitely more than that uh, but yeah no part of it was okay because I kept seeing them come in and you have like so many of them like every Trojan woman that has ever existed has got, got like five books written about them there's no minor goddess that doesn't have um a book written about them and I was like but like if nothing else nobody was writing about Dido who feels like she's right there um and I was like, the the Romans have got two things over the Greeks. One, they're better. And two... <laughs> it's going to be like the most controversial interview I upload. <laughs> like... I'm going to get death threats for that one. I'm sorry, they're not better. They're just funnier. <laughs> but more importantly, the women that are there are real. Um and I like talking about real women more than I like talking about mythical women. So so it was a bit like I wanted to have just a little toe of the Romans still exist too. And it's not just like big army men who and emperors. There's way more to the Romans and to the Roman Empire than than just manly manliness. Um, so, but yeah, I chose my side early. And so every so <laughs> often I have to stick up for it because the Greeks are getting too much tension at the moment. So. <laughs> Well, when you see all of these books coming in, because you had to narrow it down, at least if I'm not mistaken, did you say at the event that we went to in London that it was 15 women originally and then like 25 yeah. women and then it ended up being 21 women? It was start My original pitch was 15 women for no real reason other than that. I liked the number 15. Um, and, uh, and then it, One World bought it um and they have like a mini series which is a history of x in 21 women so they did a history of britain and then a history of the world and then a history of islam and they were all in 21 women so like would you bump it to 21 women and i said oh, okay like more women is always better um and so uh, so that was how it became 21 women and then i made uh, originally when I was making the 15 women list and then to add like another 21 I made like a massive list of all the women that I could possibly think of um, some of whom we don't really know enough about some of people who had like obviously too many books written about them already um, and then cut out everybody who already had a book uh, like who already had a popular book anyway um, and then cut out as many of the empresses as I thought I could um, <laughs> and then um and then tried to make sure that I had people from every single part of the empire. So every or part of the history of Rome. So the Republic, the kingdom, all three parts of the Republic, which was tough work. <laughs> and then that they didn't, or I didn't have like a load of women that are just from that popular period. So I didn't want like seven Julio Claudian women and then like two other types of women. <laughs> um, and that I had them from different parts of the empire. Um and but yeah, so it it expanded. Um, and some women had to be cut, um, and some women were added in at the last minute. But um, it was a f felt like quite a cruel process, like <laughs> <We're> cutthroat. <laughs> yeah, a bit like oh no, you're too popular. Sorry, you can't join my club. <laughs> or uh, some of them were like they've only got like there's so little that you can say about them. Or if you would have to say you would have to extrapolate a lot. So like one of the women or one of the two women that I was thinking about, the two women whose names I've now forgotten, who um, left their footprints on tiles. Um, so they're two enslaved women who put, they put their footprints on tiles and then write their name on them. Um, and which is amazing like that we have these names of these two women who made tiles and then the tile was found on the roof of a building. I think it was in Spain, but somebody can correct me on that. Um, but that's everything we know about them. Uh, <laughs> and that I would then just have to extrapolate out and just talk about enslaved women in general. Um, and I wanted to be telling biographies. So some people would just, even though I would love to have had them there, um, 
I couldn't really write more than a paragraph on them specifically. <laughs> well, did it help as well, like working in the bookshop and like seeing what people were buying and seeing what people were purchasing and being like, okay, I don't know, Jennifer Saints Atalanta is doing really well. <laughs> so people clearly yep. like warrior women. So Boudicca's going in the book. Like, was there any way that you were using sort of the bookshop to help you filter those oh, women yeah. out as well. Well, I mean, I don't don't think I would have written it if I hadn't been working in the bookshop because I don't think I would have known how popular the the whole kind of ancient women trend was. Um and the kind of stories that were being told, like these ideas of women reclaiming their power um or of a kind of reinterpreting the actions of women like Medea as not not um or Medusa or you know Electra as being not victimized but powerful um within the things that happen to them as, as survivors and that kind of thing um was definitely like okay this is what people like but also I'm wildly contrarian as a person um and so whenever anybody is like so I wrote this book about warrior women I'm like okay well now I've decided that I only like women who refuse to be worried <laughs> because oh, um, <laughs> uh, I'm horrible and like my my knee-jerk response to anything is um is if um if somebody else has done it then I don't want to do it if you know what I, mean. I kind of have the same knee-jerk I can't yeah. lie I do the same thing <laughs> and so I really wanted to include like domestic women so I, one of the reasons why Turia was always in there from the beginning um and was always because I also really like um, and think it's important to kind of disrupt the idea that the only way to access power is by acting like a man or by um, being a warrior or being um, like being a politician, being an empress and entering these masculine spheres. Like that is the only kind of power that exists or the only kind of power that is worthy. I think that there is also power in being conservative and being... Um, and it is not the kind of power that kind of vibrates through the generations and that gets you, it doesn't look very cool like later on, but during your lifetime, it is actually a way to um, to kind of maintain power and to maintain the respect of men by behaving, essentially. <laughs> um, and so I did really want like domestic women and women who behave themselves and this I, and women who are not kind of traditional heroines in the way that we might imagine them um and Boudicca is in there mostly because I really wanted to do Cartamandua um again because I'm contrary and I like like Cartamandua is such a quizzling like she just completely throws herself in with the Romans and it's like you seem cool what can I do for you <laughs> And it, like, and as a result obviously she never got a film made about her but um <laughs> during her lifetime she gets off way better that like her lifetime as far as she's concerned from her perspective she made totally the right choice um because her life is so much better but Boudicca's right in the middle of her lifetime um and she makes the very conscious decision not to join in with Boudicca's revolt like to absolutely look the other way um and so I thought well I can't can't just skip over Boudicca <laughs> can't just be like oh yeah and in the middle there was a rebellion the end um <laughs> just never mention it again <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> because it's super important to Cartamandra's story that that happens and she doesn't do it but also from the kind of the way they're both literary constructions like we both know about both of them pretty much exclusively from Tacitus and a bit of Dio um and Tacitus presents them as being like two sides of the same coin so um it's also fun to show how when we're reading history and reading the romans history of themselves that they are presenting it in a in a fashion that is not necessarily the most truthful and respond like is often archetypical rather than um rather than accurate <laughs> Well, speaking of Boudicca, for everybody who doesn't know, Emma's got a great podcast episode on her podcast about Boudicca, which is so fun and so informative. And the thing I love <laughs> about your podcast is that you guys are just having so much fun when you record them and it's so obvious. See, so somebody emailed us uh, uh, the other day to say that we laugh too much. It's like, I enjoy the information, but you laugh too much. <laughs> disagree completely disagree i was like okay <laughs> maybe don't listen to do maybe just listen to a different more serious podcast it's fine because we just like each other and we're having a good time <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, in that episode, you said something really interesting about Boudicca, where you said that you think Tacitus tries to make her the new Lucretia as yes. well through his writing. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. So this is a theory. I think it's Marguerite Johnson who came up with it. It's definitely where I read it. And the more I read about it and more I think about it, the more into it I am, which is that. Um, so basically, as you know, the story of Lucretia is that she is kind of a, a you know, a perfect woman and she um, is representative of all that is good about the world. <laughs> and then uh, the, the king, um, the king's son Servius uh, rapes her and then she kills herself and then as a result of her um, the violation that she has received and the fact that she has killed herself she is um, paraded around uh, by Brutus who then let like brings down the tyrannical kings and, um, and institutes the glorious republic which can do no wrong and is perfect in every way um, and Basically, the story behind that is that the king has become so tyrannical that even the private home, even the you can't even protect your women anymore, that the tyranny has entered every facet and nothing is safe and even pure, good, wonderful things are not safe. Um, and so the... The Tacitus's version of Luke, of um, Tacitus's version of Boudicca is the only version that has the idea that she is raped and beaten, or that her daughters are raped and beaten, and then she goes off to persuade everybody to fight by displaying her lash marks and showing everybody how um, how she has been brutalized. And she says something like, "Even women are not protected anymore." And she shows off her daughters who have all been abused. And then she does this huge speech, which is in classic Tacitian style. All all about freedom versus slavery and the tyrannical king who is going to like the tyrannical Nero who is going to oppress them all and um how they have been submitting to slavery and da, 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 da. um whereas the dio version is um there's none of the kind of physical attacks um and she is 100 percent interested in uh tax so the i don't know if you've ever read the dio speech I about haven't. her but it's literally just so the first half is so long the first half is like we're being taxed really badly um and just goes on and on about taxation for ages and then the second half says plus nero's a girl um <laughs> and it has this hilarious thing about how we'd basically it, it seems pretty clear to me that dio is writing about elagabalus in that section because he keeps calling him seraphis and he's talking about him dressing up as a woman and how we can't be ruled by a woman and you're like are you aware that you've made a female character say this? <laughs> it doesn't seem like you're aware that you made a woman talk about how bad it is to be ruled by a woman while ruling then. For sure. <laughs> okay. But basically the theory is that when Tacitus has written his version of Boudicca, which is not in any way making up what happened, but making up how he presents her, he is thus making Nero into the true tyrant. And it fits into his wider narrative of how Nero, alongside Agrippina, are the true death of like the worst that the empire could ever be and the how the principate has become so appalling that it's even raping women now um and it not even private life is not safe and that is destroying everybody's freedom and therefore he is the new Tarquinius superbus and uh, she is a kind of lucretia figure and it's kind of using those tropes that would be instantly recognizable to a roman audience who has known lucretia um from the beginning of time um to to see what he is saying that he's not saying she was literally raped he's saying like she was violated in this fashion that we recognize basically that's so fascinating <laughs> i'm gonna have to go and google that afterwards and for you guys that were also listening to it being like what i'm gonna link whatever i find in yeah. the uh, description below along with obviously your podcast episode where you talk about this as well because <laughs> the... literally i paused it when i was listening to it like <gasps> what <laughs> yeah so I think that people forget a lot of time because we read Tacitus as a historical source and like for the facts that he is giving us and it's super useful and he's so good at um, just like giving you a scene and giving you a character and giving you an idea like with such a small amount of words that you just completely believe it immediately but you forget that his is a literary project like it's not a um, I think of him as being more like a Hilary Mantel than like what we would necessarily recognize as an academic historian. <laughs> like he's not there looking for like fundamental truths. He is looking for a narrative which connects to um, his idea of the world. And it is a literary project, not a like objective truth project. 
Speaking of that though, what I think is really interesting is the idea of going into all of them that you've written about through the source material, but through a lot of these, no other way to describe it, wacky stories that some of them come <laughs> with. And yeah. they do, like there is, there's the fl- the fireplace one, which is wacky, which you can get into if you want to. <laughs> like there are lots of them as you're reading it that you're just like, I know this is said in the source, but obviously this didn't happen. Now, <laughs> as a historian though, as the person writing those, and this is a question that my audience love, is how do you as the historian go into that and try and pull out, okay, well, this is probably what this story means and this is probably what it's referring to and what can we learn from this about this particular woman? It's a tough balancing act, is like going into the sources, especially things like, um, so the story of Ecclesia having to get pregnant from the phallus that's in the fire there's is, no other way of that, saying that. Like, yeah. just... um, and she is encouraged to do so by her queen. Um, and like, to me, it is a, there in order to explain why an enslaved woman was allowed or like why the son of an enslaved woman became the king. Like this, like they're so hierarchical and they're so um, obsessed with status and in, with the concept of slavery as being permanently a stain upon the entire family that the Romans just can't wrap their head around it um but if that was in one source you'd be like okay Pliny all right <laughs> um Pliny's having a moment again or like just written down everything that somebody told him but it appears in like four sources um and at that point you have to think okay there is a narrative tradition here that even if like, regardless of whether they believe it or not, it is a tradition that is kind of part of the background of the story that they tell about the Kings. And like the same way that there is like, you find people who believe in King Arthur, but most people don't really think that King Arthur and the Holy Grail is a real thing. Like, but it is going to come up in virtually every version of like a history of Britain or like if you're talking about medieval Britain in some way, someone's going to mention it at some point. <laughs> and it's kind of part of the texture of the way that people talk about the medieval, like early medieval world as being somehow magical um, or like medieval Britain as being somehow imbued with some kind of ancient magic. Um, and that's kind of the same way that the Romans are writing about it is that they know it's the very past. Some of the sources include it as a, obviously this is ludicrous. So like, Livy refuses to fall for any of this. He thinks he's like the most serious man that ever existed. And so he's like, no, obviously this isn't a real thing. Um, it, actually, she was the queen of whatever town she was kidnapped from and therefore he was royal blooded. And that's why um, they adopt him. Um but other sources like Pliny is like, and then it turns up in Ovid as well, like they will repeat it. Ovid includes it because he's telling stories of magical relationships with the gods and, and mythical stories. Um, and Pliny includes it because he thinks it's fun. Um, and uh, But it's clearly like part of the part of the versions that are, are circling around and you know obviously it didn't happen uh, <laughs> but one it's irresistibly funny um, and two it is um, obviously a, a way that they thought about it even those of them that didn't think about magic there is a mythical version of the story of how Servius comes to be king which includes that he was fathered by a god um, of unknown origin in a fire <laughs> Well, on the topic of balancing acts, though, your book is so funny. Emma. Like, <laughs> I, as I was reading it and I was like in public, I regretted every single time I left the house with it. So I was like, I've now got to sit here and awkwardly like <laughs> pretend like I'm not holding in a laugh, even though like your brackets on the side, like literally had me cackling at the pages. They're so funny. But your writing is so informative and so still so, I don't want to say academic because that might be like off-putting to somebody who's listening to this that you know maybe isn't in the academic world or maybe has never stepped into the academic world but you can learn so much from this book because it is just so like bang bang sources yet it's so funny is that a natural way that you write or is that also kind of like a really difficult balancing act for you (laughs) as a writer and your inner academic wanting to come out uh I'm basically just a I was more difficult for me to write in a purely academic style because I think that the Romans are funny. Um, and I also think that connect like connecting them to the real world is funny or to the modern world. Um, there's a lot of amusing ways that you could do that. 
Um, and I was always getting told off when I was in academia um, for like putting puns in or um, like or try or, or being funny. <laughs> and I was, my supervisors, bless their hearts, were always making me take out those asides um, because I think it's funny. And also like writing is very lonely um, and you are I write mostly kind of late at night and I write the book that I would want to read basically which is the book that shows you what history actually is doing like it's not just copying out Livy and it's not just copying out Dionysus but it's taking the 150 different versions sorry this is Livia by the way she'll say hello there we go. she's so cute <laughs> it's taking the 150 different versions that are told about um, each source the the different competing ways the ways that we know about the, the ancient world and then um, trying to piece them together into some kind of theory and when you're doing that which I find super fun like the interesting part of history to me is not so much like the individual stories but the bit where you have four different authors writing at four different times or writing at the exact same time and all telling a slightly different version of the same story like the hundreds of different versions of Tarpeia um, in which which she opens the gate for like either because she is in love with the Titus Tatius or because she wants his bracelets or because she is actually tricking him to give up the shield so that she is sacrificing herself in order to make them weak so that she can save the city or like all of these different ways of looking at Tarpea are, are so fascinating um and that's the interesting part so that's the bit that I really enjoy writing but also I'm writing usually at midnight um with like a cup of decaf coffee and Livia staring at me and um I like to make myself laugh like if when <laughs> uh, I like to be like this is exactly like in Arrested Development um <laughs> or <laughs> And if I chuckle, then I'm happy and it just entertains me for five minutes and then I move on to the next bit. So that is, um, but it is, that was my natural style of writing. And I always used to have to tone it down for academia. Um, and uh, now I get to in include those bits and it's much more fun. <laughs> so with this book though, you've done so many interviews for this book. I mean, you've done loads of interviews anyways, because you have other books as well that obviously you've written just so everybody knows again linked in the description below you can find all of Emma's books because she has a number of them and they're all again funny and informative anyways is there a woman that has surprised you that people have latched onto so much like that you keep getting asked about that you're like <laughs> I'm surprised that everybody really likes her oh <laughs> uh, it's uh I'm, I'm kind of a uh surprised I think maybe that people like Julia Felix um I like Julia Felix um but I um but people love Julia Felix I'm kind of delighted by that um that pleases me um the I think I'm surprised that people don't like other women as much as I like them like I really like Julia Balbia um and my mum is going to Egypt next week and she's going to go and see the Colossi of Memnon and I'm like please ask them if you can see this inscriptions by Julia Balbia like please ask if they're still visible and if you can take pictures because I think she's brilliant and I think that her dedication to having her name known and like not just this is Julia Balbia but this is Julia Balbia and this is my family just so you really know who I am um and like her her position in the world is so fascinating and I think that she is um her kind of mediocre poetry is delightful <laughs> See, that's what um, I was gonna say is like the funniest part of her is that like she's like this is me this is my poem this is who my family are and then her poems like aren't that good so maybe she should have not been so specific fine. yeah <laughs> Uh, but I, I love that. I love that they're just like, okay, poems. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're not so terrible that you would remember them for being awful. And they're not so brilliant. They're just like slightly florid, stodgy, mediocre poetry. It's one, <laughs> I think that's great about her. <laughs> so I always want people more to ask me about her. Um, but I don't think there's anyone that has surprised me that people are really into because they're all great. Um, like... I think people are into the ones that um, are the most emotive, maybe. Uh, so Julia Felix is has kind of a lot of emotion, like the fact that she potentially dies with the whole house 
um, is a motive. I think the Tilia as well. Um, I love that people like Tilia and her kind of infertility story. And Zenobia obviously has been very popular because she has the idea of her kind of rampaging across the Syria desert and declaring herself an Augusta and just being like, everybody else seems to be making themselves Augustus. Like we've had about 75 in the past 20 minutes. So I reckon I can join in with this. <laughs> she just has kind of great aesthetics more than anything. Um, <laughs> and then being caught running uh, on a camel across the desert is also great iconic um, yeah julia barbier is probably my one that i wish more people would yeah i like the i like julia mesa as well i think she's great um, really what do you like about her in particular uh, i just like that she was like so you seem to have sent me home and i really actually quite liked being the emperor being in rome so i'm just gonna come back um uh, and she just immediately uh she gets sent home which is quite nice of them really to overthrow like julia domina kills herself and then um her sister goes home and she turns like it takes about three minutes to turn around and go no i'm going back to rome like i do not want to be back in a mess um i liked being the most famous person in the world and i am going to drag my 14 year old very unwilling nephew behind me so grandson uh, regardless of whether anybody likes it or not it turns out that nobody really liked him being the emperor um but then she makes him the emperor she is the power behind his throne for his entire reign but somehow she manages to avoid being murdered when he is murdered um and then put a, like so she does two coups um one from syria and one from rome and then she's deified when she dies um, and everybody's forgotten about her well, the one woman that I'm surprised more people don't ask you about is Claudia. Because yeah. she, so I don't know how it is now, but when I was studying, was it for GCC or for A-level? I can't remember. But we had to read, the, like Claudia was part of the actual syllabus. So we had to go into Claudia. So I've always kind of had her in the back of my head as like, ooh, her and Clolia, who for a very long time, yeah. I was like, oh my God, they're not the same person. But those names are <laughs> unbelievably God similar. Romans and their names, yeah. Oh my God. Little like 16 year old me was like, what is, who is who and what's happening? But Claudia was so interesting to me. And so when I saw that she was in your book, I was like, yes, we get a moment for Claudia. And then when I listened to all the other interviews, no one seems to be as interested with <laughs> the Medea of the Palatine as I was. And I was like, oh, mm-hmm. it's just an us thing. Maybe it's just us. Um, I think the Palatine Medea is an extraordinarily fantastic insult from um, Cicero. It's one of Cicero's finest out. Really annoying thing about Cicero is even though he was a little twerp, uh, he was really good at arguing. <laughs> so can you tell Don't us we... a bit about her, just for people who might be listening yeah. who are like, who is Claudia and what in the world are they Claudia? talking about? So Claudia is this... Uh, kind of the archetypical new woman of the late republic um and she is remembered from two major sources really one of which is um cicero's procaelio which everybody kind of does when they're doing gcse or a level latin i think um which is his defense of his little friend caelius um who has been accused of attempting to murder both a, a alexandrian uh diplomat and also claudia um and uh, the other is from Catullus's poems about Lesbia, which are believed to be about um, Clodia, largely because he says that Clodia is the brother, is the sister of her brother Lesbius the Beautiful, which is an obvious reference to Clodius Pulcher, who's an infamous, um, <laughs> infamous nightmare of a man uh, in the late Republic. Um, and they are these two um, kind of rabble rousing new. Uh, young, difficult people in the late Republic. And in the poems about Lesbia, she basically kind of, Catullus falls in love with her, they have an affair, then she goes off and is having affairs with other people and he's very sad about it and it kind of veers between Lesbia, you are the most beautiful person that ever existed with your little sparrow, to I hate you, you're a whore, why would you do this to me, to a series of other people that he is having sex with. Um, And in... The Procaelio, she is the Palatine Medea, whereby Cicero constructs a story that Claudia likes to seduce young men by doing things like owning gardens um, and having parties. Disgusting. How could she? Uh, how could she? Unlike all the other women who do none of those things. 
and that she tried to seduce Kylius because he's young and handsome, um, and that Kylius had rejected her, so she had invented this entire plot um, to do with her lending him money to assassinate this Alexandrian diplomat and then him trying to poison her and this incredibly convoluted thing to do with him trying to buy poison from a bath attendant and then Claudia catching him in the act and all this stuff. But basically his thing is that she's a slut um, and you can't believe anything that she says because she's only making all of this up because he spurned her and hurt her feelings. Um, And as a result, she comes across in kind of a lot of modern portrayals as a woman who is just kind of very so either sexually free or sexually aggressive who was constantly having parties who had 200 boyfriends um and a sparrow uh, <laughs> but she's also in cicero's letters um before he falls out with her where she is clearly like negotiating she's just in the mix of of late republican politics like she's taking messages backwards and forwards between caesar and pompey she's giving atticus all the gossip in greece she is um had like giving out seats at the um at the theater as political favors she is not letting her brother have any seats she but she's kind of has this power and she's using it i think if we just had cicero's letters we'd be like what a interesting politically savvy woman who's like really engaged in the politics of her brother and against her husband but because we have these other two sets of letters we're like what a slut um <laughs> but she can be both she can be you know she can have a boyfriend and also murder an Alexandrian prince and also, <laughs> sorry, diplomat, not prince, um, and also um, be, um, you know, be a political operator who chats to Caesar about his tactics in what he's going to do in the Senate tomorrow. Um, and I think it's great that we have the, like a lot of different perspectives on her so we can see all of the ways in which she was. And you can be both. <laughs> And I also think that Catullus is very cruel to her because he's like, how dare she break my heart like this? I have had sex with seven men in order to make myself feel better. (laughs) You see, reading those poems made me, this is like a controversial thing that I always say on my channel, which is like, I can't stand Catullus because I think he's a whiny (laughs) baby. But it's specifically from those. Like it's from those series of poems that I've always just been like, I I can't handle him at all. Like... (laughs) No, he's such a mighty baby. I think he has like uh like incel vibes, which is that he is a person who would be like in your DMs being like, I love you, you're so beautiful, I love you, you're so beautiful. Why would you talk to me? Why could I see you talking to another man? You're a whore, I hate you. I never thought you were pretty anyway. <laughs> like literally that exact yeah. vibe of then like he's gonna block you and then he's gonna unblock you one day and be like, yeah. Are you thinking about me as much as I'm thinking yeah. about you? So I'm so sorry for no. what I said earlier. I didn't mean it. Like <laughs> I actually think that you're so beautiful and then he's going to be liking all your posts for the next two days <laughs> and then you won't respond and then he's there going I hate how could you Lee, do this to me yeah he's such a like <laughs> oh gosh so my audience as we were discussing before we got on the call are all North Americans now all of you guys who are watching because the majority of you guys are from North America whether it be Canada or the US can now buy this book how yeah. exciting so for that audience, like, what do you hope that they're going to take? Because in, I mean, I went to university in uh, New York, so I know that people aren't opened up to the ancient world as early as we get to be opened up to the ancient world. So a lot of these women, a lot of these stories, a lot of even these sources are going to be like so new to them and like so exciting to them. So for that audience, like, what do you hope that they get from this book? I hope that they get the idea that Rome is more than just like five white guys standing in a white room in white togas, like being very serious at each other. (laughs) I think that that is the kind of general sense of what Rome is. If you only peripherally know of it or like think of it, I, I, I just wrote a thing for The Messenger about that idea that men are thinking about the Roman Empire all the time which is like 95% American men who seem to be in the gym all the time Um, and what they think about is Marcus Aurelius Um, one of them hilariously was like I think about um, I'll send you the link to the things that has a link to all of my favourite versions of this meme Um, one of them was like yeah yeah like Marcus Aurelius and Alexander the Great I don't Um, even have like a proper response to that 
There is a really good bit in uh, Daniel Lavery's book um, where she uh, where he rewrites um, the Marcus Aurelius's uh, meditations as uh, as affirmations. Like today, I'm not going to let people hurt my feelings. It's me responding to the Senate, not them. <laughs> Like, from now on, I'm no longer gonna feel gonna let them get to me like this. <laughs> oh my god! Um, and once you have read them like that, you can't read them as serious anything anymore because it's just like a guy being like, "Oh, they no, I'm not gonna let this happen anymore." Um, <laughs> Look at himself in front of a mirror, like, "This yeah. is what's happening today. I'm powerful. Yeah, I'm a strong emperor." <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh god. Um, and but yeah, but that is what they think about. And then they the other thing they think about is the Roman army um and conquering things. Um and it, largely it is the kind of stuff that you sort of don't want them to be thinking about when they think about the Roman Empire, which is that it's a bunch of fascists conquering people and that's good. Um and so what I would like people to see is that it the when we talk about the Roman world, we're not just talking about that part of like that is part of what the Roman world is, but it's a tiny part. Like the army and the emperors are like a minuscule part of what the Roman world was, which also included people running businesses and people living their lives and people struggling with infertility and people, um, you know, living all over this huge empire, living interesting, multifaceted, being multifaceted people um, who also sneezed and lived exactly like we do and a, a kind of more complex than that version of the Roman Empire allows you to believe. Um, so that's kind of what I would like to think of the ancient world as a place that existed and as more than just something for men to enjoy in a masculine fashion. Um, And hopefully that they were really funny as well. (laughs) Well, with all that being said, Emma, I have taken up quite a lot of your time, which I appreciate so, so much. But obviously it means that we do have to kind of wind this in at the moment so thank you so much for joining me today emma it means the absolute world that you took time out of your day to sit and to chit chat and to dive into some of these incredible women and of course thank you to you guys who are listening who are watching and who are engaging with this content because i mean without you guys i literally couldn't have conversations like this As I said at the start of this episode though, you guys can find links to History of the Roman Empire and 21 Women down in the description below. And you can find links to all of Emma's social medias as well as other books down there. So do not forget to check that out for more information and in order to kind of springboard from here into other podcast episodes, other socials, whatever it happens to be. But thank you guys so much for tuning in and we'll be seeing you next time with more videos here on Moan Inc. So I'll see you guys then.